with uh, both titles, but uh, I titled it, It's Not About Me. And Lee, you're probably going to recognize some of this because I took it from Gary from the Men's Breakfast, but it really, the thing that he did really hit me as far as uh, worship is concerned and that stuff. So, and the other name I, I was going to, well, I'm just going to name it both those names. Why are you here? Think about that for a moment. Why are you here? Why are you in this very room? We'll discuss both of those titles here a little bit. Worship is the highest and noblest act that any person can do. When men worship God, it's, it, God is satisfied. And when you worship, you are fulfilled. I don't know who wrote that, but I found it. And I thought that was very profounding. Think about this. Why did Jesus Christ come? He came to make worshipers out of rebels. We who are once self-centered people have to be completely changed that, so that we can shift our attention outside of us or me, of ourselves, and become able to worship him. With that said, let me do what I always do. I'm going to ask you that question again. Just ponder, ponder on it a moment. Why are you here? Now think about it. What is worship all about? What does it mean to you? Let's look at some reasons why we may be here for. Maybe it's to show off that new dress. Or maybe it's to show off a piece of jewelry. I wore my, yeah, I don't have earrings in, but <laughs> some, of, some of you do. Or, show off a new pair of shoes. Or maybe, to show that you bought a new car. It's parked out in the parking lot. You know, you could have just drove by and blew the horn and we'd have seen a new car. You didn't have to come in, you know, but you did. Now here's one that I really wish for. People wanting to show off so they sit in the front row. <laughs> now you know in the Jewish synagogue, those seats were contested for. I mean, they were, they were the ones that were coveted. They wanted people to sit in the front row. That list could go on and on, but let's turn to the Bible. I'm going to read something to you that's very basic, and maybe you won't even understand why it's part of worship, but I, it, I'll bring it all around for you. I am going to uh, turn your Bibles to Genesis 4, and we're going to go through verses 1 through 15. Genesis 4, 1 through 15. And I'm going to kind of paraphrase it as I go through. So uh, Now, Adam and Eve knew, Adam knew Eve, his wife. And she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she brought again, this time his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. Now, in this, it, it doesn't lay out to us what God told them to do. It doesn't lay that out at all. All it's letting us know is that we're supposed, they, they were supposed to offer. Now, they knew what they were supposed to offer. Okay, so Cain knew that his offering was not what God explained it to be, is what I'm trying to get at. It's not written in there, but we know from, from reading it, that's what it was. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel's offering, which... We have to believe that that offering was pleasing to God. And that's what God wanted him to offer. He would not have uh, said, well, you guys bring your offerings to me and then I'll decide which one's the best. God didn't say that. I know he wouldn't have done that. He said, you bring the first of your flock, the best of your flock, bring it and that's what you're going to sacrifice. But as usual, man wants, wants to change the rules. And the Lord respected Abel in his offering, but he did not respect Cain in his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his consonants fell. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fell, fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? 
And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and it desires it for it desire its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now God was trying to explain to Cain that I made a rule, and you have to live by it. If you don't live by it, then you're, there's going to be consequences. Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose against Abel his brother and killed him. Now some of the translations say slew, and then the uh, translation for slew is actually slaughter. So in other words, it would have been a, uh, uh, like when you see a, uh, a woman or a husband that's stabbed 30 or 40 times, it might be the spouse, they might be mad at him, you know what I'm saying? And that's basically what happened here. The brother was mad at the other brother and he slew him. And I guess this was actually the first death that was described in the Bible, really, when you come right down to it. But remember what God said to Adam and Eve about that tree in the garden. What did he say? You shall die if you eat it. And Satan said, no, that's not true. You're not going to die. And she bought it. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I your brother's keeper? My brother's keeper? And this is kind of uh, your, like how your kids smart off to you. This is uh, kind, of what, kind of what Cain was doing to God. He was telling them, you know, I don't know where he's at. Am I, what am I, somebody that keeps track of him all the time? Knowing full well that he had killed him. And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out for me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive you, brothers, your brother's blood, from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. And fu a fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. And this is very interesting what he says to God. And Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. And when I read that, I think, then why didn't you just ask for forgiveness? Why didn't you just ask God to forgive you and start doing what you were supposed to do? And what do you think God would have done? He probably would have forgotten, forgiven him. But no, he goes, Surely you have driven me out of this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face, I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth, and it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. And as I said before, you notice here he didn't ask for forgiveness, he just went on with the rant about what was going to happen to him. So in other words, it was, it was all me. It wasn't, it wasn't God, it was all me. Me, me, me. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall take it, be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Now you might say to yourself, what does this have to do with worship? And I ask the question again, why am I here? Or why are you here? From the very beginning, God gave instructions on how we should worship. It's not written there, but we get the point that they had to offer to God and what they had to offer. I mean, if you read that story and you can't get that out of it, there's something wrong with your understanding because the idea is the one person did it and it was right, the other person did it was wrong. Now, God didn't come down and say, well, I, I, I didn't tell you not to do that, but you know, here's the way I want you to do it. He came down and said, this is the way I want it done. And then, of course, man decides they want to do it another way. And that's basically what happens with some of this stuff. We even find this even written in the New Testament in Hebrews 11.4. By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testified of his gift, and through it he being dead still speaks. Let's look at another New Testament story and see what we can learn about the Christian in the way that they worshipped in the first century. Let's turn our Bibles to Acts chapter 7. And we're going to read on from the, uh, from the first verse, I think, on. Didn't mark that in here. What did I do? Put the chapter, but I didn't put the verse. 
And it starts out, on the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and became, because his intent to leave the next day, kept, and he kept talking till midnight. Now that gives us the when. They came to worship on the first day of the week. And it even tells us in the, uh, what uh, they read it from the communion table this morning, they gathered on the first day of the week for communion also. So this is what they're telling. Now, what do you think would happen if I preached till midnight? Well, maybe not, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to warn you. Well, maybe I shouldn't, because if I say I'm going to do it next week, nobody will show up. <laughs> but no, they were so hungry for the word. I mean, we don't have to be, we have to be hungry for the word, but we don't have to be hungry for the word in the way they were, because we have the written word. We have the Bible. We have the book that God gave us to look it up and, and to read it. So let's go on in the rest of the second part of verse 7, first, verse 8. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where, where, we were, where we were meeting. Seated at a window was a young man named Ithacus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Now this young man fell asleep. And then they picked him up dead. But Paul comes to the rescue. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. And he said, don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive, and they were greatly comforted. Now, with this passage in mind, let's look at some of... What God's words has to say about Christian worshiping in the first century. First of all, notice that it says they met on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. They met on that day for a celebration of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The Old Testament Jews went on the Sabbath day or the seventh day of the week to comm commemorate that God created the universe and everything in it in six days and then on the seventh day he rested so the Jews it was to be a day of rest and worship and we've been going over that in the Old Testament somewhat and we'll go over it when we're, even when we're studying the New Testament we're going over it but today we as Christians meet on the first day of the week and we celebrate that death of Christ and the victory that he won that day for us on that cross and I hope that we celebrate our salvation our salvation that we're going to make it to heaven if we live our lives in such a way that God has laid out for us and we celebrate the idea of that everlasting life Abel died the day his brother killed him but he went to a better place just as we will when we die if we make sure we have all our ducks in a row. And Jesus won the greatest victory that was ever won. And uh, someone mentioned in our class one time, if, if you don't understand Revelation, just believe that we won. It was a victory. And we did win. We won the war. We're in the war now, but we're going to win it. And Jesus started, the, started winning it right at the cross for us. Now, all of this ought to be all done in decency and order when we're, when we're worshiping God. We must do that. But we can take that a little bit too far. We kind of mentioned it a little bit in class this morning about tradition and scripture. And sometimes we kind of, uh, as humans, we kind of try to intertwine those together instead of keeping them totally separate. What does reverence mean? When we come in to worship God, when the time comes for worship, we should be reverent to Him. We should have respect. We should know that uh, He's here with us because we're worshiping, but this is only a building. That's all it is. It's not brick and mortar or wooden shingles, whatever you want to call it. 
But that's all it is. It's not a place where he dwells all the time because when the curtain was rent, that did away with that, him dwelling there. He's with us at all times, everywhere we go. It should be a time of reverence. The early Christians' purpose is coming together was to observe the Lord's Supper mainly. That was what it was, to observe that Lord's Supper. But they also knew that it was a time of reverence. When Jesus instituted communion, he said, As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. God realizes that we're human and we're going to forget. And he knows we're forgetful people. So that's why he established that for us. He didn't say how often to do it, but we know from history that the early church did it every Sunday. Every first day of the week they did it. That is one reason why it was very natural for Luke to report in the book of Acts, now on the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread. So we know that's part of it, and we, uh, I would rather do it more than less, is what I'm trying to say. Some, some churches have different days that they celebrate and they have communion. We have it every Sunday because we celebrate Christ's death, burial, and resurrection every Sunday. That's the purpose of us being here. Because we're Christians. That's why that word is that word. Because we are that. Not only is, the Bible, is it what the Bible says, but church historians verify that partaking of communion happened from the very first. The Lord's Supper was on every Sunday. That's why we have communion every Sunday. We know that there is a danger of communion becoming commonplace because we do it every Sunday, but I would rather have it that way than to forget about it altogether. And the chances of that happening, I hope, would be very slim because maybe I shouldn't mention this, but if you're, not reverenced, if you're not being reverenced to God at all, at least when the communion's going on, you should be reverenced to God because that's proof of his son's death, burial, and resurrection. So the observance of the Lord's Supper is a time for reverence. And Jesus even said it, This is my body given to you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. Luke twenty two nineteen through 20. And as I mentioned before, God knows we have a problem remembering because we're human. And that's why he gave us that communion. So we worship it. So worship is also a time of remembrance and reverence because we're remembering Jesus. And finally, the preaching of God's word was also pr prominent in the worship of the early church. If you turn to 1 Corinthians 1.21, it says, For since... In the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God. It pleased God through the foolishness of messages preached to save those who believe. The world regards our preaching as foolishness. Because just as I said this morning, when you're trying to spread the word, if you're trying to teach someone the truth, they'll sometimes get angry at you. And they think it's foolishness. And in Romans 10, 13 through 14, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they all call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? I'm the preacher here and I'm the preacher on the outside, but we need to also be preachers ourselves. We need to Talk to people about Jesus and tell them about what he's done for you. It may seem foolish to the world, but God uses preach, preaching also to build up Christians. To give you ammunition to go out into the world and fight the war. Wednesday night is one of the best things for that. Because when, I'm in the, when I was in the workforce and I was around people that weren't Christians my whole eight hours of the day at work... When I got to that Wednesday service at church, that was like my batteries were being recharged because I was being beaten down so much by people that just did not want to listen or didn't want to do what they were supposed to do. And in 2 Timothy it reads, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. He put that word in there that 
little short word, long suffering, because he knows what it's going to be like to try to convert people. But it still doesn't give us an excuse not to do it. There is nothing about the preaching of God that became, that, that become, it, it, the word just becomes like meat and potatoes to me as far as I'm concerned, to our soul. It may, have re be, it may be ridiculous today, it may have seemed ridiculous to them, but it's not ridiculous to us and that's why we're here. We're here to learn about Jesus and his word. But the Christians stayed up all night long just to hear Paul preach the word. Can you imagine staying up all night long to hear the word of God? Now I've been told by people that's went to Africa that people will, you better be prepared to preach for about two hours because if you quit too soon, they'll, they'll tell you, no, you've got to keep going. But an unusual event happened when Paul preached. He preached on and on and a young man fell out of the window. And they were on the third story. Now maybe this young man, he may have been a slave who had worked hard all day. The room was crowded, the air was stuffy, the smoke from the, lan from the lanterns filled the room, and he just could not keep his eyes open any longer. Have you ever felt like that? It's hard to uh, pay attention when you're sleepy. Even though you didn't want to, you might have drifted off may have pinched yourself or tried to stay awake. When I was uh, a very young Christian, I was working midnights in the steel mill. And my wife will attest to this, I'm not a very good night person. I don't work night turns very well. I could sleep all day from the time I come home from work and at 2 o'clock in the morning I'm ready to go back to bed and sleep. Just that's the way I was. But I tried to come to church one morning after I worked night turn and I was sitting on the end of the pew beside my wife and they started passing the bread and uh, they, my wife had to poke me to take the plate because I was sleeping. So from then on I decided well I'm just going to go home and go to sleep and then I'll come Sunday night because there's no use in me coming then. And then when we were, when we were uh, members at uh, Struthers we sat about the fourth row back is what we did and uh, there was a woman that sat in the second row and she was an elderly woman and uh, she usually sat beside somebody and this one morning she was sitting there by herself and Bill was preaching and I told Bill, I said, when, when you retire you should start a sleep clinic. I said, because everybody wants to go to sleep when you preach. Same with me probably, everybody wants to fall asleep. But uh, this poor old woman started falling asleep and she started doing one of these numbers, doing one of these numbers and then finally she fell over on the pew. <laughs> 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 Which was... Uh, quite funny, not to her, but it was quite funny to us, but uh, there have been people that have bumped their heads on the few in front of them, falling asleep, falling forward, or remain standing, or remain seated when everybody else is standing, or maybe drop their hymnal on the floor. Well, anyways, when this fellow fell out the window, they all rushed downstairs, but Paul said, don't be alarmed. By God's miraculous power, he raised that young man from the dead. Then they went back upstairs and ate. And then Paul began to preach again, and he preached till dawn. Worship should be a time of instruction and inspiration. A time when we're fed from the Word of God. If the church that you've attended does not teach from the Bible or they don't encourage you to read your Bible. And if all you hear from the pulpit is social problems or current events, then something's wrong. Jesus said in Matthew 4.4, 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Now let me make a couple of suggestions to help us on our worship. First of all, if we're going to be instructed, we ought to come rested. If we stay out too late Saturday night or we're exhausted on Sunday morning, we're not really giving God our best. 
And when we come here, we should be giving God our best. Another thing we can do is to receive instruction in a more meaningful way is to pray. <coughs> if you're praying for me, it's going to be awful hard for you to get bored and go to sleep. But then again, you'll have your eyes closed, so maybe you will go to sleep anyway. But it has been said that prayerless pews make powerless pulpits. And as I get older, I'm realizing that I know myself, I'm going to admit this, that I don't use prayer enough. I've been working on that idea of using prayer more. But sometimes we just neglect it. And I don't know why we do, because uh, we should be praying all the time. Because God can do anything for us. If it's his will, he'll do it. And then when you leave here, after you're done, you should be the same way those people were. They took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. We ought to go home alive and comforted. Alive because we've celebrated the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and we've gathered around his table to thank him. And it's not because we came in and heard an orchestra and five or six people standing up front and singing. That's not the kind of comfort that he's talking about. He's talking about the personal comforting you get from being in a religion that allows you to speak directly to God and talk to him about the things that you need. I'm going to leave you with this story. Back in 1948, the Tennessee Valley Authority built a dam that created the Watka, the Watka, must be an Indian name, lake, and it buried the old community of Butler, Tennessee. And in 1983, the water had to be lowered to repair the dam. Thousands of, pe thousands of people waded through the mud to see where their homes once stood and to relive memories of the past. And the reason I read, I read that to you is because when we worship God and we read his word, we're looking at that past. We're learning in the Old Testament how God de dealt with people. God dealt with the people in the Mosaic Age through the prophets. He had prophets come and talk to the people. That's how he did it. And in the Patriotic Age, he, had, he talked to the, the fathers, Abraham. And uh, it left me, but I know there's another one too. And he spoke with Moses, spoke to him about everything that went on. So we relive our memories of the Bible as it goes through. And as I mentioned before, the Old Testament talks about Jesus the whole way through. And then the New Testament fulfills everything that was in that Old Testament. I not only hope this morning's worship, but every worship we attend will inspire us to do better and to live better lives. The collective past of all the believers who have gone before us here, just think of the people that built this building and the people that decided to, hey, let's go over there and have a church of Christ. Let's go over there and have a church that follows the Bible. Let's go over there and make sure that when we build this church, people from years coming down the line after we're dead and gone will know that what this was established on and why it was established, and why we use the Bible, and only the Bible, to dictate to us what we do. And what I really want you to do is, and I have, I have to mention this, I want you to try to come to worship every service that we have. It's important to do that. It's important because of your Bible learning. Yes, you can study your Bible at home. I agree with that. But you can't get the group think that we have here, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, because it's used today in a negative way, group think here that we're looking at the Bible in an open way and trying to 
decipher what it says and get the true meaning from it. Worship's not about us. That's why we don't come here to be entertained. Worship is about our worship of God, of God and His Son. And I finish with this question. Why are we, you, us, here? That's the question I want to, I want to answer because we need to answer that in our hearts. We need to answer it to the point that we're here because God knows that we need to be here. And we know humanly that we need to be here also. Remember what I've said this morning, and hopefully it's, you know, uh, Gary probably did a much better job than I did. I did, didn't do it. I mean, that was completely all around, but the first part of it with uh, Cain and Abel was the basic unit that he used. But it was, uh, and I hope I've touched your heart to think about worshiping more than just, oh, I got to get up and go to church. Or I gotta go out. I gotta sit here for a few minutes before I, after I come from work, and then go on Wednesday night. And I know we've all had that attitude at times. Let's face it. But it's important to be here. If we're not here, we're not worshiping God. We need to do that. If you have a need this morning to be baptized, we can do that for you. Or if you have a need for the prayers of the church, we can do that for you also. Please come as we stand and sing. Would you be